Hello, my name is Sarab Sodi, and I'm one of the ultrasound faculty over at Cooper University Hospital. This uh, lecture is being recorded for uh, the oncoming intern class, so I hope you'll find this useful. So this is a relatively rapid thousand foot overview of what lung ultrasound looks like, and I'm trying to make it as evidence-based and reasonable as possible. Um, I know this is a complicated topic and it tends to scare people, but we will talk through it as we go, and if you have any questions or concerns, you can always reach out. All right, so first and foremost, why the heck do we ever do lung ultrasound? We could just do all these chest x-rays and make these diagnoses and be done with it, right? Beyond the fact that I'm ultrasound faculty, there actually is a reason. And the reason is that the sensitivity of the plain old chest x-ray is pretty terrible for most of these diseases. Now, for those of you who are less than familiar, quick reminder, that's a pneumonia. That's a large pneumothorax with some tension physiology, and that looks like CHF. So, uh, how do you know how crappy the sensitivities are? Well, a bunch of people studied it. The sensitivities are 27 for uh, pneumonia, 39 for pneumothorax, and 73% for CHF. So let's talk through these one by one. So first and foremost, let's talk through what a normal lung ultrasound looks like. So remember that in lung ultrasound, you're trying to look at the movement of the pleura first and foremost to figure out whether or not you have a pneumothorax because you have visceral and parietal pleura and as a slide next to one another as people breathe you can see that movement so historically we all thought that ultrasound couldn't go through air therefore it was completely useless and when they did lung ultrasound people would figure out that they couldn't see squat um, there was a swiss uh, I think he's a German-Swiss physician by the name of Lichtenstein, and he ended up coming up with this idea that you could do lung ultrasound. As a quick reminder, we've talked about this before, but high-frequency probes give you a nice high-resolution but low penetrance image. You can see that this is a uh, linear probe because that's what the footprint looks like, and you can see this really crisp, beautiful image that goes to about four centimeters deep. You could potentially stretch that to six or seven centimeters. We can also do the same thing with a higher, uh, with a with a higher depth probe that would be lower frequency, and those would be your curvilinear or your phased array probes. So let's look at this for a second. So here you see the rib. Now we'll start from the top. You have a little bit of skin, some subcutaneous tissue. There is a muscle if you're looking anteriorly, probably. Uh, that would be a pectoralis muscle, and then right there you see this bright shadow, this bright line, hyperechoic line, that then has a bunch of shadowing behind it where it disappears. So that looks like a rib. And then right down here, this line you kind of see shimmering back and forth as a person's breathing, that's, that's the pleura. Um, so you're seeing that there's lung sliding here, and that looks good. Now, if we looked at that same type of image with a curvilinear probe, and now here you see that's a curvilinear footprint, and what they're doing is they're starting up top at rib space, rib space. You can see that you get a much greater depth, down to about 14, 15 centimeters, which is about the depth you should be at if you're looking at the lungs um, for the question of whether or not there is something like beelines. And then as you're doing this, you're looking to see whether or not you have sliding, but that's a lot harder to tell. Essentially, here you're looking for whether or not there's artifacts. Now, artifacts are an interesting conversation, and again, this is just a very brief primer to give you an introduction. There's A lines and B lines. So A lines are essentially horizontal reverberations. So there you see sort of these things that are starting to appear. A lines will sort of be those horizontal reverberations that are purely from that plural line being really a good reflector of sound. And that gives you these sort of spaced out spots that look um, really symmetric. Now that's normal lung tissue. But what you're looking for in abnormal lung tissue is beelines, which are essentially comets that start up at the pleural line and then this bright white searchlight that shoots all the way down to the end of the screen. And that's why we do the sort of 14 centimeter historically. Now there's some people looking into whether or not that actually we need to go that deep to figure that out, but that's a whole other topic for advanced ultrasound. So quick recap so far, you can ultrasound the lungs, you can see all kinds of things, x-ray is kind of shitty, and we'll talk through the sensitivity of lung ultrasound as we go. And you can use high and low frequency probes. Now, as a general reminder, if you're looking just at the very, very superficial area, you want to use a higher frequency probe to get a better picture. If you're looking deep into someone's body cavity, you want to look with a lower frequency probe that will give you better depth. Okay. So, if you have a pneumothorax, um, the, there was a meta-analysis that they did trying to figure out whether or not there was, uh, what the sensitivity and specificity of lung ultrasound were. 
And as you can see, the sensitivity and specificity are good, uh, both in the high 90s. What I really wanted to point out was that likelihood ratio. That likelihood ratio of 50 means that essentially if you went over to someone where you had almost no suspicion of them having a pneumothorax and you did a lung ultrasound and found that they had no lung sliding and a lack of a common tail, you could be almost 100% certain that they had a pneumothorax. Now this is sort of still controversial. It's a conversation you need to have with the attending you're working with because different people have different thresholds and how they practice. But I will tell you that historically speaking, there are very few things that give you a lack of lung sliding. The one thing I will put on your radar as a big risk factor is if someone's had recent thoracic surgery, specifically something like a pleurotesis where they've made your lungs, where they've made the pleura stick to one another, you're not going to have lung sliding. So please don't put chest tubes in people with pleurotesis or other advanced sort of thoracic pathology. Okay, so as a reminder, here we go. So you're sliding, you see it's a linear probe, and someone's just sort of sliding down the chest, and you see as they're going, you see both those B lines that are starting up at the surface. At least we think they're B lines, we don't see far enough down to be sure, but you see that line shimmering beautifully back and forth. So we're thinking probably not a pneumothorax. And then you move on to the left side and you look, and here you see rib shadow again, hyper, and then everything's disappearing off underneath it, then right here you're seeing nothing really moving in this lung tissue. Now if you see this bilaterally, you really want to make sure the patient's breathing, because that's a common mistake when you think that both lungs are down, and in reality the patient's just not taking deep effective breaths or breathing at all sometimes. So that's a worthwhile test to do. Okay, and then here's another view. So you have that same image essentially with a nice nice hyperchoic rib with shadowing underneath it. There's your pectoralis muscle and then right here you see the pleural line and it's really not moving at all, making you concerned for a pneumothorax. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is essentially what's called a lung point. So here you're seeing no sliding and then sliding. And it's a bit of a jump back and forth but if you track through any area where you see sliding stop is essentially 100% specific for a pneumothorax. Moving on. Let's talk through pneumonia. So your chest x-ray, as we discussed, is pretty crappy sensitivity somewhere in the 30s. Your sensitivity here is 92. Now your likelihood ratio is 15, which again significantly raises your likelihood of having this. And in here, they're looking for subpleural consolidations and B-lines. So I'll show you what those look like. So as a reminder, curve a linear probe. So for the most part, everyone in the emergency department prefers using the curvilinear probe for lung ultrasound. A lot of our critical care and emergency critical care colleagues tend to love the phased array probe. I don't know if that's more from the fact that they typically only have the phased array probe in the ICU, um, but we continue to uh, disagree on how useful each of those probes is for this. So here again, you see that you have curvilinear probe up there, you have muscle here, and then you see what looks like lung. And I'm going to pause it and we'll walk through the anatomy one by one. So first, here's lung, there's some B lines. So in and of itself, B lines could mean that essentially they just mean that there's some sort of interstitial fluid. It does not definitively mean pneumonia, it does not definitively mean B lines. And then towards the end of the clip right about here, you see this hyperechoic line that looks like essentially if you imagine a large mouse has come through and nibbled on the lung tissue. So that's what's called a shred sign and that's again suggestive of there being some sort of consolidative process in the lung. And the two of these together make you suspicious that the patient has a pneumonia. And then you can see a more clear image of that shred sign where you sort of just see there's these hyperechoic areas which are essentially where a bunch of gunk is collected and that's causing it to be more reflective and not filled with air and then you see shadowing underneath it. All right, and then moving on into cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So this one's a little a little tricky. So in the United States, and I say that for a reason which we'll talk about in the end, in the United States, if you see a patient who comes in with acute dyspnea with bilateral B lines in two lung zones, that is suggestive of acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And again, the likelihood ratio is good, the sensitivity and specificity are great. So this is a common question of concern. What are lung zones? And people have described it about a hundred million different ways. Um, the guys who originally came up with this had a five, five point lung ultrasound, then they came up with a 12, they come up with a six, they've come up with pick a number, and they've probably come up with that type of an ultrasound uh, protocol. What, what, what we all tend to practice in the emergency department is a anterior and a lateral look and your anterior lung is broken up into two lung zones. You have lung zone one up here, lung zone two down here, and then three and four. 
on the side and then five six seven and eight so essentially it's an eight point long ultrasound so you'll take the curvilinear probe probe marker pointed upwards start right under the clavicle and then slide inferiorly as you're going looking for bee lines do the same thing on the lateral side do the same thing on the other side and that way you've done a complete lung ultrasound as a reminder if you're looking for pneumonia you really should look posteriorly looking posteriorly for your cardiogenic pulmonary edema isn't really as helpful so in this situation here's what you're looking for you're looking for you have the curvilinear probe again up here you have skin and soft tissue you have a muscle that's disappearing you see rib rib and then you see lung sliding between it and then you start to see sort of these bright white comets that are just shooting down. Now those are suggestive of bee lines. And just looking at that, you can count at least three individual ones in this one set of two rib spaces. So that makes this zone positive. Now, if you moved it over to the left side and you saw this image where you saw a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of bee lines again in one area, and then the same thing at the very beginning of the clip, that would make you concerned that if you have bilateral bee lines, your differential now has narrowed down into a either acute on chronic CHF or acute CHF versus potentially multifocal pneumonia or ARDS. It's often also helpful to look and think to see if there is a pleural effusion, which you'll often see in cases of decompensated heart failure. And so, and typically here you're seeing this large anechoic fluid collection with collapsed lung that's not actually infected, but just collapsed because of pressure waving in the breeze and that would look like a pleural fusion and then finally my last trick that i love to use is to look at the heart and see how well it's beating if you have a really crappy ejection fraction and we'll talk about how to do that more in the cardiac lectures you can suspect that the patient probably has more of a chf picture than a pneumonia picture all right. If you have any questions or concerns, that's my email address. Feel free to reach out and talk to you soon. Bye.